Hi guys, it's Mark Zickrey, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickrey of Space Command. And today we're going to talk about Jurassic World and the um, history of dinosaurs, or at least a little bit of the history of dinosaurs. Now we all, of course, know what dinosaurs are and how wonderful they are. We love dinosaurs, they're great. And, uh, but there was, of course, a time, a couple of centuries ago, when people didn't know about dinosaurs, had never heard of Triceratops or Tyrannosaurus rex or any of that. And uh, in the uh, 19th century, the, the mid-19th century, people started discovering dinosaurs, started naming dinosaurs, and Sir Richard Owen started doing full-size reconstructions of dinosaurs. Uh, Queen Victoria was mounting something called the Crystal Palace Exhibition, and uh, Richard Owen built full-size concrete replicas of what he thought dinosaurs looked like. And in fact, they actually had a banquet inside of one of these dinosaurs. Now, interestingly enough, although the Crystal Palace building burned down many, many years ago, the dinosaurs are still in existence at the Crystal Palace Park, in the lagoon of the Crystal Palace Park. And you can see these very fanciful dinosaurs. Uh, you can even probably Google dinosaurs Crystal Palace Park and see them. They're painted vivid colors. They're huge and uh, extremely inaccurate. So, for instance, uh, Iguanodon, which had a, a, a horn on its thumb, he put that on its nose. Um, dinosaurs that were bipedal were represented as being quadrupeds, etc. But still, it was a start, and they were wonderful and fanciful and great. And so as the 19th century continued, more and more scientists were digging up dinosaurs, and there was a, a fierce competition to name them and identify them and claim them. And two scientists named Cope and Marsh were at the, at the forefront of this and were bitter, bitter rivals. And, uh, and they were so eager to name, to be the first ones to name these dinosaurs, to identify them and, and have the, the bragging rights, that, uh, that there was a, um, a very famous flap where Brontosaurus was identified and we all, of course, grew up <clears throat> loving brontosaurs and so forth if you were of a certain generation. And then we found out that it didn't exist, that it was the head of one dinosaur on the body of another. And now what were called brontosaurs are often identified as other dinosaurs, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, etc. And, uh, and so we, we learned that, uh, that science, even scientists could be extremely flawed human beings. But, but nevertheless, as more and more dinosaurs were identified and we started seeing wonderful uh, artwork uh, representing them and, and showing, them what they, showing us what they look like, uh, it seized the popular imagination. We started getting short stories and books and articles and all sorts of things relating to dinosaurs. And the first great piece of art, uh, of, of written art, uh, relating to dinosaurs was The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He, of course, was the creator of Sherlock Holmes, but in 1912 he created a character named Professor Challenger, and Professor Challenger goes to a lost plateau with several of his cohorts and discovers real living dinosaurs. It was first published in The Strand, where Sherlock Holmes was first published. Uh, it was a popular magazine in England, and the illustrations accompanying it were, were just wonderful, great representations of dinosaurs. And, uh, and it was only natural that when movies started, they would try to crack at dinosaurs. But the question, of course, was how do you represent them? Because, you know, a man in a suit playing a dinosaur looked ridiculous and didn't really fill the bill. But there was a very talented uh, artist named Willis O'Brien, and he came up with the idea. It, others had attempted this uh, to li in limited ways, but he was the first great artist of what was called stop-motion animation. And later he would do King Kong, and that has just amazing dinosaurs in it. But the first, uh, the first animated dinosaurs that really were, were um, really noticed by the, by the public was in the, uh, the film of The Lost World that was done in the 1920s. Now, prior to the, rele the release of the movie, The Lost World, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle had been seeing some of the uh, initial footage, uh, stop-motion footage of the dinosaurs, and he was friends with Harry Houdini, and, and Conan Doyle believed in the spirit world, and Houdini was one of the great bunkers, uh, debunkers of mediums and, and spirituality. And so to kind of get one up on, on Houdini, uh, uh, Conan Doyle showed some of the initial footage of the dinosaurs, you know, which astonished everyone, including Houdini. And, uh, and it started to get out to the newspapers that uh, Conan Doyle had shown this footage of what, could it possibly be real dinosaurs? And very quickly, Conan Doyle realized that, you know, he didn't want to be... Uh, perpetrating a fraud. So, so they really revealed that it was actually footage that was done for a movie and it was special effects and so forth. But, uh, but The Lost World came out and it, had a, a, the, it, it was a wonderful film. It stars Wallace Beery and the stop motion footage is terrific. And it has Tyrannosaurus, it has Brontosaurus, uh, it has a Brontosaurus at one point rampaging through London. And there, there, there's a lot of The Lost World that was uh, very um, much an inspiration for King Kong, the idea of, of a prehistoric beast 
rampaging through an American or British city, a major city, but you start in the, in the jungle, the primordial jungle. And uh, Willis O'Brien in 1933, of course, did King Kong, and that was a huge inspiration to Ray Bradbury, who wrote about dinosaurs, and Ray Harryhausen, who uh, was, uh, worked with Willis O'Brien on Mighty Joe Young and then did his own uh, terrific dinosaur films, uh, stop-motion films with uh, uh, Tyrannosaurus and Pterodactyls and you name it. And so there's a whole generation that grew up with those films. Uh, essentially, you know, with science fiction and fantasy and all of these things, it's generations being inspired by the previous generations, which are, who are ge inspired by the generation before them. This is, this is how it works. And so, uh, so, of course, Steven Spielberg and his generation grew up watching Harryhausen and uh, movies like Valley of Guanji and One Million uh, Years B.C. that showed uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex and Pterodactyls and all sorts of uh, amazing uh, prehistoric creatures as, as realistically as they could be depicted at that point. And, and also, by the way, the, the, the World's Fairs were, were also famed for animatronic dinosaurs, life-size animatronic dinosaurs. Uh, Ray Bradbury told me about when he was 13 years old, he went to the uh, 1933 World's Fair and in, in Chicago, and they had uh, lifelike dinosaurs in a hall with a moving walkway, and uh, you'd only be able to see them for a few minutes as, as you were sped past on this walkway. So what Ray did was he walked backwards in place against the, wa the moving walkway for an hour until they finally threw him out so he could just admire and, and, and watch these dinosaurs. Then in the, uh, the 1964 New York World's Fair, they had life-size moving dinosaurs that, that the Disney company built, and those were moved to Disneyland, and you can still see them. In, Dis in Disneyland, uh, you know, the railroad, the little Disney railway goes past them, and, uh, and it's very fun, very, very fun, and, uh, and a callback to what we thought dinosaurs would be like in the 60s. Now, of course, nowadays we know that di the dinosaurs evolved into birds and that many dinosaurs had uh, feathery coverings over their bodies and bright colors. They were actually able to reconstruct what one of the dinosaurs looked like in terms of its feathered covering, its colors. It was uh, red and black and white, just uh, amazing, because they were able to look at the... Uh, the, the fossilized remnants of, of these cells and from the shape of the cells determine the pigment by matching those cell shapes with birds pigment and, uh, <clears throat> and hopefully they'll be able to reconstruct more dinosaurs in terms of what, they, what their colors were. But, uh, but so, so essentially in recent years there was a writer named Michael Crichton and he was a very very popular writer of novels and books and TV shows. He uh, created the TV series uh, ER and he first came to, uh, to fame with a novel he wrote called The Andromeda Strain about a disease uh, coming from space and infecting uh, a community and, uh, and trying to isolate it. It was, it was, a, it was a science thriller and, and also science fiction in that it was speculating uh, something that hadn't happened yet uh, relating to space and spacecraft and so forth. And this was a very popular book and it became a very good movie. And, uh, and so Crichton started writing a lot of bestsellers, and, and he also started to venture into film. And, uh, and he wrote and directed a film called Westworld that was about an amusement park where you could go and live out your fantasies with human-looking robots. And one of these worlds was the Roman Empire, and one was the Old West. And, uh, and the film starred Yul Brynner as a robot gunfighter who goes amok, who runs amok. The robots essentially all run amok. The park breaks down. Things go out of control. People start getting killed. And, uh, and this is uh, a, a very similar, it was done in the 1970s, and it's uh, very similar to a later film, Terminator, and the idea of, of a robot pursuing our hero and our hero having to survive, though Terminator, Terminator's uh, better done in that aspect. But the notion of an amusement park running amok, uh, he may well have been in, inspired by several deaths that happened at Disneyland around that time. Uh, uh, a worker was killed in what had been the Carousel of Progress ride, crushed between moving walls, things like that were happening. And, and of course, the, the notion of robots running amok has always been a, a great and fanciful notion. But then, later, Crichton's, uh, Crichton was, was casting out for a novel, and he had this idea. He was talking to a friend of his, and he had an idea that he actually wasn't going to pursue. And then he, then he, this friend said, oh, you must do this. You absolutely must write this. And essentially what he did was he took the plot of Westworld, took robots out, and put dinosaurs in. So he basically was re, uh, recycling his own material. <laughs> But, much, but more effectively, because while Westworld had been a good idea with rampaging robots, Jurassic Park was a great idea with uh, rampaging dinosaurs. 
And uh, Steven Spielberg was, was already working with, with Michael Crichton on ER. His company was producing it. And when he learned of Jurassic Park, he bought it immediately. And interestingly enough, he was making Jurassic Park at the same time as he was making Schindler's List. So, uh, so Jurassic Park is very much the kind of movie that Spielberg had been doing. And uh, Schindler's List was very much the kind of film that he wanted to do, uh, the one that, of course, would, would, would earn him the Oscar. And, uh, but the fact that he did two such different films and such uh, equally uh, well-done films simultaneously is, is a testament to his, his great abilities. And initially, Spielberg was thinking of using uh, full-size uh, animatronic uh, figurines of the, of the dinosaurs, plus a, a technique called go motion that Phil Tippett had utilized. And had been, it, it had been utilized in the Dragon Slayer very, very effectively. But when you know, Spielberg started seeing what could be done with CG, uh, in terms of dinosaurs, he switched over to that. So there are, there are life-size <clears throat> figures of dinosaurs, dinosaur heads, Tyrannosaurus uh, heads, etc., and legs, and then CG for the full size uh, and f full, you know, when dinosaurs are running and that sort of thing. And uh, Jurassic Park came out <clears throat> in 1993 and was a huge hit. It was actually the highest grossing film of all time until Titanic supplanted it. Uh, Jurassic Park earned $900 million worldwide. And of course, of course, given that, there would be a sequel. And Crichton wrote The Lost World, his sequel, very, very quickly. And, uh, and at first I was offended that he was using The Lost World as his title uh, because The Lost World by Conan Doyle is one of my favorite novels and it really holds up. I urge you to read it. But then I thought perhaps the reason Crichton chose that name was both as a tip of the hat to Conan Doyle but also on the thought that perhaps people uh, searching out his book might come upon that title by Arthur Conan Doyle and be curious and read that book that it might bring more people to that book. And I think it probably has. And, uh, but the, the Lost World sequel was made, and it wasn't as good as the first. And then there was a third one made, and it wasn't as good, though it was better than the second one. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, after you have a proposed amusement park that doesn't open with dinosaurs running muck, and then you just have sort of dinosaurs in the jungle and people hunting them, that's much less interesting. So the new movie, Jurassic World, just came out, and I think they, they, they hit upon something really brilliant, which was the idea of, well, in the first film they're talking about opening an amusement park. Why don't we open it? Why don't we see what that amusement park would be like? And I think that's terrific, just terrific. I've always loved amusement parks. Uh, Pacific Ocean Park was one of my favorites as a kid. Disneyland, of course. I love World's Fairs. And I think all of us are drawn to, to those kind of places uh, where we can be amazed, beguiled, distracted, uh, find wonder and enchantment. And in, in that way, Jurassic World really delivers on, uh, on what it promises. It has amazing uh, dinosaurs. It shows us this amusement park with, with water shows with Mosasauruses eating uh, full-size uh, white, great white sharks, which of course is a, is a tip of the hat to Spielberg's Jaws. And, uh, and it has, you know, uh, Tyrannosaurus and Velociraptor and all the great dinosaurs, and, and, and then it goes one better. So, so it's, it's a very fun film, very entertaining. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, the characters aren't, aren't as good as Jurassic Park, um, though the actors are good. Chris Pratt and, uh, and uh, Dallas Bryce Howard, or Bryce Dallas Howard. And, uh, and, uh, and the kids are actually very good, too, in, in the film. But uh, it has its fits and starts. It has its weaknesses. But, uh, but it's certainly a really fun summer entertainment. This really is a return to the 70s and 80s. Uh, and early 90s uh, this summer of, of films. But so far, I think the films that are coming out are really of quality, and I think they've returned to a kind of storytelling that really entertains, and it's not, it's not cynical, which is very, very good. I think, it, it, I think this is good. It's not dark and bleak and hopeless. These are stories that are meant to leave the audience laughing and cheering and stomping and longing for more, and I think there will be another Jurassic World movie. Uh, there's a plot line in, in, the, in this one that, uh, that leaves it open for a, for a sequel, definitely. <laughs> So we'll see what the future brings. And, uh, and, and as we get to see more and more dinosaurs and speculate on what they were, were like, I mean, it's interesting because Jurassic World presents very um, standard dinosaurs, kind of gray-tinged uh, dinosaurs, where, of course, we, le we learn that they were brightly colored and many covered with feather-like coverings. So, but Jurassic World does not choose to, to do that interpretation of dinosaurs. There was a recent scientist who did talk about reverse engineering birds into... Uh, into dinosaurs, and he was talking about taking a chicken and giving it uh, a, a long tail like a, like a dinosaur and teeth 
and, and so forth. Because it turns out that birds actually, uh, when they're in, in, in the egg, have uh, embryonic teeth and, and long tails, much more like dinosaur tails. And so essentially, if you just turn off the, uh, the switches that, 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 that uh, delete those features, you can get something much more like a dinosaur. But of course, I wouldn't choose to reverse engineer a chicken. I would choose to re reverse engineer an ostrich, because that is much more like a bipedal uh, predatory uh, carnivorous dinosaur. So that is what I'd like to see. So maybe we can do a Kickstarter campaign at some point to raise uh, the money to reverse engineer an ostrich back into an ostrichosaurus. So anyway, that, so on that thought, <laughs> this is Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command, from the bamboo lair of Jurassic World, wishing you all the best. Until next time. Bye-bye.